on page 59. Let's start chapter 3. Duties and responsibilities of licensees. Now, the duties of the real estate agent are not only just those that are legally imposed, but we also have some ethical responsibilities to the public. And something, as we've talked about earlier, something could be legal and unethical, and something could be ethical and illegal, right? For example, talking on your cell phone on the, with, without a hands-free device might be ethical. You're not hurting anybody. You're driving from here to Palm Springs. There's no, no traffic. There's, you're not intoxicated. But that's illegal, but you might argue that that's ethical, right? It's ethical but illegal. Cheating on your spouse is legal, but most people would agree that that's unethical, right? So if you look here on page number 59, ethics at the bottom of the page is not the same as legality. What is legal could still be unethical, for example, and vice versa. Now, on page number 60 and 61, employee versus independent contractor. This is super important for the exam on page numbers uh, 60 and 61. Super important for the exam. So, as you know, there are two ways that you could work for someone. You could work for someone as an employee, or you could work as an independent contractor, employee or contractor. It's important to remember that in the eyes of the law or the real estate commissioner, they always look at you as an employee. A hundred percent of the time, you're considered to be an employee. However, as you know already, if you've taken principles, tax purposes, compensation purposes, work hour requirements, you're generally treated how? Independent contractor. So again, the law will look at you as an employee, tax purposes, compensation purposes, and work hour requirements, how are you treated? You're an independent contractor. And you can't just call yourself an independent. Like our receptionist here downstairs, she's not an independent contractor. Definitely an employee. Why? Because whose computer is she working on? Company computer. Who tells her when to come in in the morning, when to take a lunch, when to go home? The company. There's an extreme amount of control over that employee. Now, at the bottom of page number 60, there are three reasons why real estate agents are considered independent contractors at the bottom of page 60. There's three reasons. Number one, each salesperson has our own license. Each salesperson is licensed as an agent on our own. We have our own salesperson's license. If you go to Wells Fargo, does each teller have their own teller's license? Of course not, right? They're working under the company. Look at number two, super important also. You only get paid when you sell something. Compensation is not based on hours worked. Compensation is based on the sales made. How about number three? There's a written contract. We have an agreement that says that you are to be treated as an independent contractor. So we agree. These are the three core reasons why real estate salespeople are considered independent contractors. We get paid only if we sell something. We agree that you're an independent contractor. Everybody has their own individual license. Real estate brokers love the fact that their sales staff are independent contractors, mainly because we're not required to provide, well, they, we don't have to pay our portion of the payroll tax, right? When you have an employee, not only are you, is the employee paying in, the employer is paying their portion of the tax. As a 1099 contractor, I just give you your money and you figure it out. And I write it off on my own on page number 60. Now, what's interesting here, if you look at page number 62 and 63, because you're an employee in the eyes of the law, is the broker liable for whatever the salesperson does wrong? Yes. yes. The broker has liability for what that salesperson screws up. Do you remember the legal term for that? Respondiat superior. Let the master answer. And you'll see this in bold at the top half of page 62. Respondiat superior. So the broker is liable for whatever the salesperson does wrong, just like an employer is liable for what the employee does because you're considered an employee for legal purposes. Now, what I want to show you here uh, on page number 64 and 65, some of the stuff we know already, on page 64 at the top half of the page, you'll see the term secret profit. Because you have that fiduciary duty to your client, 
You cannot make any money off of that client without the express written consent of the client. Just like in our case of Roberts versus Lamonto, $1.2 million secret profit, got to give that money back. You have that fiduciary duty to your client, which prevents any secret profits. Now, you got a duty for, to protect your client, but not against everything. We're not expected to know as much as like a lawyer would or a CPA would, for example. That's why I love this case from 1993 at the top of 65 called Carlton versus Tortosa. Now, in Carlton versus Tortosa, this involved an experienced investor called Carlton. Why do you think it's important that the book points out that this guy is experienced? He's supposed to know what's up, right? He's supposed to know better. Carlton asked the agent how many days he had to reinvest the sale proceeds. The agent told the owner to, quote, ask your tax person. I love that, I love that response. Look, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert. Ask your tax person. Carlton was unable to reach his accountant, but the accountant's assistant told Carlton that he had 45 days. After the sale, Carlton learned he owed approximately 34000 bucks in taxes. Carlton sued the agent for professional negligence in failing to recognize a tax-deferred exchange situation. The Court of Appeal emphasized that a real estate agent has no duty to give tax advice. The listing statement, quote, a real estate agent is a person qualified to advise about real estate. If legal or tax advice is desired, what should you do? Contact an appropriate person. I love this note. If the agent had given tax advice, then the agent may have been liable. But look, we shouldn't overstep our boundaries here. We should only advise on things that we're qualified to advise about. Now, two contractual relationships that are important to know for the exam are net listings and option listings. Net and option here on page number 65. Now, to understand the net listing, there's a fundamental truth about real estate listings that we have to know. How much of a commission are you legally allowed to charge? Whatever you want. Completely negotiable, right? Negotiable between the client. Net listing. This is where you say, look, I'll try to sell your house, for example, for 400000 Anything above 400000 becomes the commission. So you'll try to sell the property for 400K. Anything north of 400,000 becomes the agent's commission. This is a net listing. It is where the amount of compensation is not predefined. It's any amount over some specified net price. What's that called again? It's called a net listing. Now, in some states, this concept is illegal. In some states, you cannot have an open-ended compensation arrangement like this. California allows it. But let's be honest. Do you typically hear of people talking about net listings or do you typically hear of like 6%, 5%, 8%, whatever? Here are percentages. Here's why. Let's say that this house is actually worth like 600000 But you somehow tell this seller that, hey, look, it's only worth four hundred, and here's why. You get an offer at six hundred, and now all of a sudden you got a $200,000 commission based on the fact that you fraudulently represented to that seller what the true value of the property is. That's going to subject you to liability. Now, the other side is also true. Let's say you think you're the greatest real estate agent ever created, and you take this net listing at 600. You get an offer at 601. The seller wants to accept it. Now, you're stuck doing all that work for 1000 bucks. So net listings, they are legal in California, but they're generally avoided. Why? Because if you set the net price too low, it looks like you're taking advantage of the client. If you set the net price too high, you might get stuck doing a whole bunch of work for no money. This is called a what again? Yeah. Net listing. Now, either way, does the client have to be fully informed of the amount of compensation before they agree? Yeah. Of course, right? To avoid a claim that you made a secret profit. This is a net listing. Now, an option listing here at the bottom of page number 65, an option listing basically gives the agent the option of what? Buying it. Excellent. The option listing allows the listing agent to now become a buyer on the property. What's this called again? It's called an option listing. Now, next to option listing, I would write three things. 
next to option listing. If you are going to exercise your option on an option listing, there are three things at a minimum that you got to disclose to that seller before they agree. Three things you got to disclose. Here's the first one. The amount of profit. If there is any chance of you making any money ever on this property, what do you have to do? Disclose it. Now, that's a tall order because I don't know if I'm ever going to make money or how much I'm going to make or what I'm going to make it or what I'm going to sell. But remember, you have this fiduciary duty toward your client, which basically means you got to make sure that that client's not getting screwed, especially by you as the agent. So number one, amount of profit. Now look, if I buy just a regular property in the MLS, or you buy as an investor, just some regular property, do you necessarily have to disclose this? No, because it's not your client. You only have to make this disclosure when you buy what? One of your own company listings. So number one, the amount of profit. The second thing that we have to disclose is that you are no longer just an agent. You are now also acting as a what? Principal. You're no longer just an agent. You're now also acting as a principal. Look, I was your agent, but now I'm also buying it. Sign here. The third thing that you have to disclose is the existence of any other offers. So you can't just throw all the other offers to the side and merely present your offer. Totally illegal, right? So three things that you have to disclose to your client. Number one, the amount of any anticipated profit. Number two, that you're now acting as a principal. And number three, the existence of any other offers. Now again, do I have to disclose all this stuff if I'm just buying a regular listing out of the MLS? No. This is only because you never have that you ne this fiduciary duty never leaves, right? You still have that agency relationship with the client. So two things here, net listing, the commission is any amount over some specified net price and an option listing. What's happening in the option listing? I have the option of what? Buying. buying it. I have the option of also acting as a buyer. And you'll see this on page 66. There's a little more thorough discussion of this, a full page on page 66 when you're acting as a buyer. Now, again, as the book says on page 66, some companies will not let their staff buy in-house listings because they feel that they may also be buying litigation in the process, right? So some companies won't let you even buy one of your own company listings because of the heightened disclosure requirements when you're purchasing an in-company listing. Now, moving on in chapter three, if you look here on page number 67 at the bottom, we talked about the agent as a buyer. We talked about the net listing. We've talked about this fiduciary duty. But on the bottom of page 67, a lot of people hear a lot of these cases and they think, well, shouldn't the buyer have been paying attention? Shouldn't the buyer have been awake, right? If I see, for example, that there is a patch in the ceiling that looks like it might be a leak, why do I actually have to write that down to point it out to the buyer? Doesn't the buyer have eyes? Couldn't the buyer actually see that that roof looks like it might have a leak in it. That concept of, look, let the buyer beware at the bottom of page 67 is something called caveat emptor. And caveat emptor is a Latin term that you've probably heard of in other industries, but caveat emptor is a Latin term that means let the buyer beware. This is a lot of the time true as it relates to like buying used cars, buying, you know, iPods off eBay. You got to be careful to make sure you're not going to get screwed. But in real estate, particularly in residential real estate, this is not how our world works. Caveat emptor is not how our world works. This is not just, hey, look, let the buyer beware, let the chips fall where they may. As agents, we have a duty to protect our buyer at the bottom of page 67. So let the buyer beware was formerly a precept of business. This is not how it works in residential real estate. And if you look at page number uh, 68, Part of where this comes from, frankly, is this lawsuit, 1984, called Easton versus Strasburger, at uh, the top of page number 68, Easton versus Strasburger. Now, basically, what happened in Easton versus Strasburger was, long story short, let's ju I'm just making um, just a quick overview. Basically, there was a house here that was built on, like, filled land, right? And, of course, the soil has to be compacted very tightly to prevent uneven settling. Now, if a house settles unevenly, there's some red flags that are associated with the property settling unevenly. For example, uh, there might be hairline cracks on the walls. 
the windows and the doors might not close properly. There might be an uneven subfloor. In this case, the agent testified that the agent saw all of these things, cracks on the walls, uneven subfloor, etc. Also, the agent testified that there was exposed netting on a hillside. Now, of course, the reason there's exposed netting on a hillside is to keep the damn hillside in place. Buyer buys this house. Agent apparently doesn't point these things out to the buyer. Now, of course, you might say, well, why the hell does the agent actually need to point this stuff out? Shouldn't the buyer know? Shouldn't the buyer be paying attention? But the buyer doesn't have to pay attention if there's agents involved. The agents have a duty to protect the buyer. Out of this case, what really pissed the buyer off was the buyer spent $170,000 to buy this house. Remember, this is the early 80s. That's a lot of money. Hell, it's a lot of money now. But in the early 80s, it's a lot of money. The cost to fix this house, $213,000, right? So one seventy dollars to buy it, two thirteen dollars to fix it. Buyer's pissed. Now, out of this case, Easton versus Strasburger in 1984, this affects you 30 years later. Out of this case, every time you sell a property now, every time, without exception, you must do a reasonably competent, diligent, visual inspection of normally accessible areas in the property. So the Easton case, if you look at page number 68 and 69, I'm paraphrasing for you on these two pages. Basically, every time a real estate agent sells a one to four unit residential property, commercial property is exempt. You do not need to do your visual inspection on commercial property. This is only for residential one to four unit property only. Every time we sell a property, we now have to do a reasonably competent, diligent, visual inspection of normally accessible areas in the property. Do I have to go under the roof? No. Under the roof? Hell no. Under the property? No. Am I moving furniture around or trying on appliances or opening kitchen cabinets? No. I'm just doing a visual inspection of normally accessible areas in the property and reporting my findings to the buyer. Now, both the listing agent and the buyer's agent, both agents have to do this visual inspection. Now, your broker is going to train you on how to do this visual inspection so you don't get yourself in hot water. But a lot of brokers will recommend doing this in three steps. Observe, ignorance, recommend. Observe, ignorance, recommend. For example, here's how this would work. My earlier example regarding a, a, a stain in the ceiling that might be a leak. So you're looking around this house, doing your visual inspection as required under what law? What, what lawsuit required this? Easton versus Strasburg, right? Or Easton disclosure. Observe. Stain noted in ceiling. Ignorance. Unable to determine cause. Recommend. Recommend further evaluation by a licensed contractor or roofer. Right? Observe. Ignorance. Recommend. Stay noted in ceiling. Unable to determine cause or if active. Recommend further evaluation by a licensed contractor. Observe. Ignorance. Recommend. What a lot of agents I see do, which is totally dumb, is they say, stain in ceiling Seller says, not active leak. Probably not a big deal. Because they want to keep the deal together, right? They, don't, they want to downplay some of this stuff. Don't downplay it. Just to tell the truth, right? Stain noted in ceiling. The truth is, I don't know what's causing that. Unable to determine cause or effective. Recommend further evaluation by a licensed roofer on pages 68 and 69. You might also want to say, for example, furniture blocking some walls. If they have a bunch of big furniture... I don't, I'm not going to move that. I don't have to move that. If there's a big patch of mold or a missing piece of drywall behind that big kitchen or behind that big armoire, I, I'm not moving that. I don't know because I don't have to move it, frankly. So this is Easton. Out of Easton, what do we have to do? A reasonably competent, diligent, visual inspection of normally accessible areas in the property, of normally accessible areas in the property. Now, we should report these findings on pages 70 and 71. We should report these findings on a document called a TDS. A TDS also, a T, what a TDS is, a TDS is the Transfer Disclosure Statement. 
And you'll see this at the top of page number 70. The TDS is the transfer disclosure statement. If I had to pick one disclosure that agents and sellers should take more seriously, it's this, the TDS or the transfer disclosure statement. Now, let me show you the form here. Now, if you look at the bottom of page 71, one thing that I'd like to show you here on page number 71 is uh, at the bottom of the page, you'll see patent defects and latent defects. And you'll see these in bold at the bottom of 71, patent defects and latent defects. Patent defects are obvious, right? Obvious defects are patent defects. Latent defects are those unlikely to be, uh, to be seen by an inspection. This is a latent defect. So patent defects are obvious. Latent defects are those that might not be seen by a physical inspection. Now, I want to show you something here on pages 72, 73, and 74. 72 through 74. This is the form I was referring to, the TDS or transfer disclosure statement. Now, if you look at 72 and 73, do you see any place on 72 and 73 for the agent to sign? Does the agent sign anywhere on 72 or 73? No. Hell no. We don't touch this form with our pen. I use a blue pen as an agent. You as the seller use a black pen, right? Why do I do that? To make it, to show, at least, because when we go to court, all I have is my paperwork. So to show that two di it was a different pen, it was a different person, a different you know, nib, different uh, you know, width of the ink, it is not me. That was not me that said that roof was new when it was really old. Now, you'll use something to generate your disclosures when you become a realtor called zip form. Now, zip form, you can, it's like a P PDF creation thing for real estate documents. The zip form software won't even let you fill out these first two pages. Even if you try to click on it and try to fill stuff out for the seller, it won't let you, right? It forces the seller to do this on their own. Agents can't even touch 72 and 73. At the bottom of 72, see letter A at the middle of page 72, letter A. Middle of 72, letter A. Look right above that. It says seller is or is not occupying the property. Why do you think it would be relevant to know whether or not the seller is or isn't occupying it? Perfect, right? If they're occupying it, they're more likely to know what's happening with the property than if they're not occupying it. Perfect. So at the bottom of page number 72, there's all these little check boxes there, right? Do you have a sump pump? Do you have a garage door opener? Do you have a sprinkler system? Do you have an alarm system? Then at the bottom of page 72, it asks, are any of these not working, yes or no, to fully disclose to the buyer the true condition of the property. On page 73, there's all sorts of other questions that the form asks on page 73. Do I want to know if there's any part of the property made without permits? Of course. Do I want to know as a buyer whether or not there's any neighborhood noise or nuisance problems or lawsuits affecting title of the property or any zoning violations? I'm going to want to know all those things on page number 73. Now, on page 74, this is where we do, on page 74, our Easton disclosure, our reasonably competent, diligent, visual inspection of normally accessible areas on the property. This is required under what law? Or what lawsuit? Easton, right? Easton versus Strasburger. Top of page 74. Top of page 74. This is for the listing agent to fill out at the top of 74. Right below that, Roman numeral 4 at the top of 74, this is for the buyer's agent to fill out on page 74. So Roman numeral 3 is for the listing agent. Roman numeral 4 is for who? The, buy, the selling agent or the buyer's agent fills out Roman numeral 4. Both agents are required to do this visual inspection under Easton versus Strasburger. No, it's, the question is, um, what if there's hairline cracks that develop next week or next year? It's only at the time of inspection. It's only at the time of inspection. How do you prove that it that showed up there. later and it wasn't there earlier? That's the question with any lawsuit, right? How do you prove it? Just a question of testimony.
frankly. Some people recommend taking photos or videos. Some people don't. You know, everybody, your broker will kind of train you on how to, on how to fill this out. So basically, he said, she said. That's life, isn't it? At the end of the day. So on page 75 at the bottom, where it says death on the premises, death on the, well, let me show you two things on page 75, frankly. First, at the top of page 75, you'll see where it says natural hazards, natural hazards. Now, does the seller, does the seller have to disclose whether or not the property is in an earthquake zone, fire zone, flood zone, et cetera? Do we have to disclose that? We do have to disclose that. But here's the problem. Let's say that this is your lot for your house. And this is, yes, no. So this portion of the property is technically in the earthquake zone. This portion of the property technically isn't. So do you think real estate agents and sellers of real property want the liability of interpreting these maps? We do not. So what do we do? Like most things in life, you just pay somebody to do it for you, right? You could hire a company like uh, propertyid.com or a company like Disclosure Source. And these companies basically are GIS companies. They map the earthquake zone, fire zone, flood zones. They superimpose a street map on top of it and make the appropriate disclosure. So on page number 75, yes, sellers of real estate have to disclose whether or not the property is in an earthquake zone, fire zone, flood zone. We do. However, most sellers and agents don't take that liability on themselves. They hire, now what do these reports cost? Call it 80 to 120 bucks, something like that. 80 bucks to 120 bucks is basically what these guys charge to generate these reports. Now, on page 75 and 76, if you look at the top of 76, Reed versus King. Reed versus King kind of was the rule back in the day for death on a property. In Reed versus King, a real estate agent failed to disclose five murders kind of a lot, that had occurred 10 years ago, kind of a long time, right? So the agent was like, damn, five murders, that's a lot of murders, but 10 years, kind of a long time, ah, forget it, I don't want to kill the deal, I just won't say anything. How do you think that the, the buyer, in this case, found out that five murders occurred 10 years ago? The yeah, all the neighbors, escrow closes, all the neighbors come over with pumpkin pie saying, man, you got some guts. I was like, Gus, what do you mean? I can't believe you bought this house. Five people were slaughtered on the, you know, you don't want that problem. That was Reed versus King, 1983. This has been replaced, bottom of 75. This has been replaced with the civil code, section 1710.2, which governs disclosure of death on a property. There's three rules about death that we should know. Three rules about death. First rule, if the death happened within the last three years. So first rule, if, the, if somebody died on a property, now some students say, well, what does on a property mean? What if someone died in the front lawn or in the backyard, in the garage? It's in the property line, right? Not inside the property. If somebody, so roll them into the street, worst case scenario, have the chalk line not on your property. If they died on the property within the last three years, then what? But is this disclose mean only if the buyer asks? No. no. This means if somebody died on the property in the last three years, I've got to volunteer that. I have to openly volunteer the fact that somebody died on the property within the last three years to who? The to the buyer. Volunteer it. Mr. Buyer, somebody died on the property last three years, sign here. Now, naturally, if you're buying a property that I'm selling and I tell you somebody died on this property last year, your next natural question is what? Well, how'd they die? You tell them how they died. Unless the death happened due to AIDS or HIV-related illness. If somebody died due to HIV or AIDS, you don't disclose how they died. Now, a lot of people question that. And they say, well, well, why? The truth of the matter is, is that there's still, even in 2013, 2014, there's still a bit of a social stigma, frankly, associated with this illness, right? You remember in 1992, Summer Olympics, Magic Johnson, recently diagnosed with HIV. A lot of players in the U.S. and around the world didn't want to play with him, if you remember. Going back 21 years. But a lot of people did because they were like, oh, if he sweats and, I and I'm cut, you know, am I going to get infected and all sorts of nonsense. 
So we don't make the HIV AIDS disclosure. Now, the irony of this is, if you ask me, how do they die? And I say, I can't tell you. Because this is the only exception under the civil code for 7010.2. Third thing about death. If the buyer asks, not HIV AIDS, but if the buyer asks, did anybody ever die on this property? So let's say the husband and wife, you're touring them through a home. The wife turns to the husband and says, you know what, honey? I bet you someone died here. I can just feel it. I bet you someone died here. And the husband turns to you as the agent and says, hey, do me a favor. Ask the seller, did anyone ever die here? You know, in fact, I'll put it in writing. I want to know. Did anybody ever die here? Let's say, let's say some uncle died on the property eight years ago, and you know about it. Now if the buyer asks, do you have to disclose it? Yeah, because yeah. now the buyer is telling you that that fact is material. Remember, anything that could theoretically influence a buyer's decision must be disclosed. If I'm telling you, I'm asking you, did anybody ever die here? Now you know that that's material to me, which is going to make you have to tell me if you know or should know. So three rules about death. First rule, within the last three years, what do you have to do? Disclose, volunteer it to a buyer. Look, somebody died here last year of cancer. HIV AIDS disclosures are unnecessary. If the buyer makes a direct inquiry, not about HIV AIDS, but if the buyer makes a direct inquiry regarding death, even if the death occurred more than three years ago, now what do you got to do? Got to disclose it to a buyer. Make it in writing, though. But the truth is, this is done in writing on a form called the Seller Property Questionnaire. So there's like nine questions on the first page of the Seller Property Questionnaire. One of them asks, did anybody ever die on the property or within the last three years? Did any occupant die, yes or no? And there's another form called Buyer Material Issues. So the buyer is going to make a, a statement on the Buyer Material Issues form saying, I wish to know if anybody ever died on this property. So you would do it in writing. That answered it? Oh, that was easy. Okay. Little two for one there. Bless you. Right. So all of these disclosures are do you know or should you know? That is, if somebody died on a property 55 years ago, nine owners ago, I'm probably not going to know that. I'm not, frankly, I'm probably not going to know that or not going to know that. And there wouldn't be a reasonable basis for me to know that. Now, if a property has been in my family for the past 35 years and my uncle died on it 25 years ago, and I get asked, did anybody ever die? Now I'm going to have to disclose that because I should know. It's been in my family. It's reasonable, right? I've been in the, it's been in the family for the last 25 years. So the question with all this stuff is, did you know or should you know? Now, a couple of uh, last things here that I, want, I wish to talk to you about in Chapter 3. One of these is at the bottom of page number 78, Salahutin versus Valley of California. Salahutin versus Valley of California. This is one of those times where you got to do your homework, you know, and I don't, I don't know why uh, agents uh, don't do this more often, but long story short, in this case, Salahutin versus Valley of California, there's this couple. Couple's got two kids. Couple goes to a real estate agent and says, hey, I want to buy a piece of real estate and I want to chop it in half. Sorry, my drawing isn't exactly half, but you get the idea, right? I want to cut it in half. One for one kid, one for the other kid. At the time, in order to subdivide in this area, the original lot had to be at least an acre. So this agent searches the MLS and finds a lot. The MLS description says lot at one acre plus. Escrow closes. Several years pass. Kids get older. Start the subdivision process. Come to find out, the lot, 0.998 acres. Agent gets sued. Guess who wins? Buyer or agent? Buyer wins, right? Because the only reason that this couple was buying this lot was to what? Subdivide it. 
So the agent should have taken greater care to make sure that the lot was able to be subdivided. Or tell them, look, if you don't want to go, if you're lazy, like a lot of people are, I'm lazy too. If you don't want to measure it or do your homework, just tell the buyer, I know the only reason you're buying this is because it's an acre. I don't, I'm not going to measure it. Before you buy it, you agree that you'll measure it. Sign here. Fine, whatever, right? As long as they're okay with taking that liability on themselves. It's just when you don't say anything, the escrow... Now, what's wild about this, check this out in this case. If you look here on the third paragraph at the bottom of page 78, right in this gray box, third paragraph, constructive fraud can occur when the broker is merely an innocent conduit of misinformation. The court applied damages in this case based on the value at the time of discovery rather than at the time of purchase. The buyers paid only $274,079, but it would have been worth $1.1 million in 89 had it had the ability to be subdivided. So, again, if you're not going to do this, work for your buyer, fine. Just tell the buyer, I'm not going to do the work. You agree that you'll do it, and you'll satisfy yourself. Sign here. I'm not going to work, basically. And if they're fine with that... Well, okay, at least you have a strength in defense. Here, the agent didn't do any of that, represented it was an acre, and was found liable. So be careful. For, for the newly assessed price. Yeah, right. For what it would have been worth at the time of discovery if it were an acre, not at the time that they bought it. So much. Right, this is true. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. These are all changes, though. Look, look when this case happened, right? 94, right? Those are, these are changes we've put in the MLS over time and in our forms over time. Now our forms say your agent hasn't taped the property. We don't know about boundaries and square footage and lot size and all that. And the buyer signed forms saying that now. The difference in value between what it would be worth if it were 0.998 acres or what it would be worth if it were actually an acre. And in this case, it was several hundred thousand dollars. And there's no limitations. But the statute of limitations, when it, because this is a fraud case, is from the time of discovery, not the time that the fraud was committed. So, now, I don't want to scare you, right? Because all these cases, you know, it's all about agents <laughs> effing up, you know? I don't, want to, I don't want to scare you too much. Just, you know, do your homework. A lot of this stuff, the condo queen case, what an idiot, right? Yeah. Frankly, this case... You know, do your homework, frankly. I mean, if you're going to make several, we're not getting paid 50 bucks. I mean, we're getting paid several thousand dollars. If you're going to take on this responsibility, spend 20 minutes and either, you know, and hire someone or recommend that they hire someone to tape the property, right? Or go to the city and make sure that the lot is able to be subdivided, right? If you're not getting paid chump change, you're getting paid serious dough. So, you know, just do your work. If you do your job, you, you know, most of the time you're going to be, you're going to be just fine. Now, if you look here on page 79, middle of page 79, a blind ad at the middle of 79. A blind ad is an ad that fails to disclose that the advertiser is an agent. Anytime we run an ad, every time we run an ad, in the ad, we have to disclose that we are an agent in the ad. And, you know, a few years ago, Senate Bill 1461 passed, which basically says that every time we give someone our card, website, email signature block, what do we need on that? our license number, right? So we got to disclose to the public that we are agents in the ad. Now, if you look at page number 80, you'll see at the middle of page 80 the term puffing. Right next to puffing at the middle of page 80, you'll see it in bold. Right next to puffing, I would write the words not fraud. Puffing is not fraud. Puffing is a sales statement. Like, here's an example of puffing. You and your wife are going to be so happy here when you buy this home. Is that some written guarantee of your bliss for the next 50 years? No, of course not, right? That's puffing. If, let's say that I'm showing you a property and we go into the kitchen. There's double ovens. You know, some of those, some houses have two ovens where you can cook for a lot of people. If I say, well, Thanksgiving's coming up, I bet you you could put 50 turkeys in those ovens. Now, if you try to stuff 50 birds in those ovens, am I going to be liable for that? No, it's not meant to be a fact, right? Now, if I say the roof is brand new and the roof is 40 years old, that's not puffing, that's lying, right? Puffing is an exaggerated sales statement made to induce someone to buy, but it's not meant as fact, and equally as important, it's not heard as fact. 
it's not meant as fact, and it's also not heard as fact. Now, very common question. I want to lay this to rest once and for all. Everybody asks me this question, and here is the right answer. Here's the question. Let's say you have a cousin that you have not spoken to in a long time. Now, you start posting on your Facebook page about your real estate classes you're taking. You know, man, this class sucks. Can't believe I have X more hours. You know, ugh. And your cousin sees you on Facebook making all these posts about real estate. So your cousin, who you haven't spoken to in a long time, says, hey, you know, I'm moving from New York to L.A. I want to buy a house. Now, you don't know if your cousin's rich or poor. You don't know how much money your cousin has. You just say your cousin wants to buy a house. Now, you say, look, I can't help you because I don't have a license yet. Wait for me. Your cousin goes, I can't wait. I need to buy a house like now. Can you refer me to a good agent? So you're like, hey, I know this guy. His name's Karthik. I'm going to refer you to this guy that teaches this class. So you refer this client over to me. Five months go by. I run into you at the housewarming party that your cousin, you know, the house your cousin bought. Nine million dollar home in Bel Air. Right? You see me. Got a new haircut. Right? Got a new car. Fur coat. You know, all the things rich people do. Now you're looking at me getting out of your Honda Civic. And what are you thinking? Exactly. Right. Give me some. I don't want a piece of that. Natural. The question now becomes, can I pay an unlicensed person a referral fee for the introduction? Yes. Very common question we get all the time. What's the law on this? Now, we can all agree that if you don't have a license, I could not throw you my Supra key, that electronic key to open houses, give you my MLS login and say, look, you find something for your cousin. I'm busy. Once you find something, just call me and I'll put the deal together. Totally legal. We'd all agree on that because I can't give you my key and all that, right? However, all you did was introduce me to your cousin. Can I pay you a referral fee? Now, California doesn't give a damn. The state of California says, look, you can pay an unlicensed person a referral fee of any amount. Pay, give them your whole commission if you're dumb, right? Do whatever you want with your money. California does not care. However, and I keep telling Bill, who uh, him and I worked on this textbook together, I keep telling Bill, hey, look, you've got to fix this. You've got to make it clear because the way the book reads right now, this is only California rules. That's why if you look here on page number 81 and at the bottom of 83 and top of 84 where it says fees to non-licensees, the book says, rightly so, California doesn't give a damn. California says pay a referral fee to an unlicensed person. As long as they're not being paid for something that needed a license, pay them. However, the federal law is different. There's a law called RESPA. RESPA stands for the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act. We'll talk about this in Chapter 8 in Principles. RESPA says two things. First one, if it's a residential transaction and there's a loan involved. RESPA says, I cannot give you a penny in connection with that deal. So your cousin who bought that $9 million home in Bel Air, if there was a loan involved in that deal, was there probably a loan involved? Yes. Probably so. If it was a residential transaction with a loan, I can't pay you anything. It triggers a RESPA provision which requires licensure. California still doesn't care either way, residential, loan, cash, whatever. But RESPA says if it's a residential transaction with a loan, I can't give you anything. Residential transaction, you pay cash, what can I give you? Whatever I want, whatever we agree on. Commercial transaction with a loan, whatever. Commercial transaction, cash, whatever. Residential transaction with a loan, I can't pay an unlicensed person a referral fee of any amount ever under RESPA. Why is that? It's the way the rule is written. Because residential transactions with loans require uh, heightened disclosure requirements. They're just more. John and Sally Smith, again, buying their first time home, don't want unlicensed people in the room with them, right? Residential cash, presumed to be a little more sophisticated. Commercial, you're presumed to, they don't watch the money flowing as much when it's residential cash. 
Residential with a loan, RESPA kicks in. That's the same thing. Yeah, most stringent applies. Yes, it is. Same thing. Most stringent applies. So on page number 83, fees to non-licensees, back, kind of piggybacking on 81, can you pay an unlicensed person a referral fee in California? Does California care? No, nah, California doesn't care. <coughs> Federal law under RESPA, residential transaction with a loan, triggers a RESPA provision, which says what? You can't pay one red cent to an unlicensed person on a residential deal with a loan. Residential cash, what could you do? Have fun, whatever you want. Commercial loan, do whatever you want. Commercial cash, do whatever you want. Raw land, whatever you want. Residential with a loan, nothing under what law? RESPA. RESPA. Excellent. Now, on page 83, you'll see the Sherman Antitrust Act here on page number 83. This law is designed to prevent monopolies. It prevents price fixing on page number 83. Brokers cannot agree on minimum commissions to be charged. It prevents, so all the brokers couldn't get together and say, look, we're not going to charge less than 6% on anything. Illegal, under the Sherman Antitrust. Market allocation. Real estate brokers cannot come together and divide up the city and the territories. Coldwell Banker Century 21, Keller Williams Prudential, we agree not to cross into each other's territory. Totally illegal. Group boycotting. Firms cannot get together and refuse to do business with a particular company. Tie-in agreements. Real estate brokers cannot require that you use our escrow company or our title company as a condition of doing business with us. These are all violations of what again? Sherman Antitrust. And that, of course, is the end of Chapter 3.